Alright, just wanted to take a quick second to look back over section 1 of chapter 8. Okay, chapter 8 deals with chemical reactions. Section 1 is kind of an intro to reaction, what makes chemical reaction, you know, different things like that. The first thing we need to remember are the four indications that a chemical reaction has occurred, or the four signs of a chemical reaction. The first one is the evolution of heat and light. Okay, If you remember, I did a demo where I lit a piece of magnesium on fire using a Bunsen burner. It had an intense bright light. Okay, If you stared at it too long, it kind of left a little impression on your eyes. That's an example of evolution of heat and light. Formation of a gas is the second in indicator. All right, You saw a formation of a gas when we poured vinegar and baking soda on each other and it bubbles up. You know, those bubbles are being produced. That's the formation of a gas. The third is the formation of a precipitate. You saw that when I did the demo. I mixed two clear liquids together and I had that bright yellow solid form. Okay? And the third is the color change. Um, the previous example where I had the precipitate form, I had two clear liquids come together and it was a bright yellow product. Also, I had two clear colorless liquids where I poured one into the other and it turned hot pink and then I poured it back and that hot pink color went away. So that's an example of the four signs of a chemical reaction. Okay, The second thing we need to remember before we start talking about chemical reactions is the law of conservation of mass. Remember the law of conservation of mass tells us that mass is neither created nor destroyed in an ordinary chemical reaction. All right, The total mass stays the same. So if we have 4 grams of hydrogen and 32 grams of oxygen on the left side, we must also have that same total, 36 overall, on the right. And remember, only the rearrangement of atoms is what a chemical reaction is. You can only rearrange atoms in a chemical reaction. So if I have 4 hydrogens and 2 oxygens on the left side of this reaction, then on the right side of the arrow I must also have four hydrogens and two oxygens. That's crucial to remember. Chemical equations have two parts. Part A and B we call the reactants or the left side as you'll hear me refer to it. And C and D is the products. Call that the right side of course. Right? Some, chem some symbols that you may see frequently used with chemical equations. These are found on page 246. There's a whole table of them. But if you see an arrow, it means to produce, to form. I'll also say yield. If you see a plus sign, that means plus or and or added to. If you see a little s in parentheses, that stands for solid. That's the state of matter in which the reactant or product is in. For example, if we use solid zinc plus liquid water in a reaction then we would indicate that by solid liquid or gas. AQ is a little bit different. You may not be familiar with AQ. AQ stands for aqueous that is dissolved in water. That the solid is dissolved in water. Okay. If you see an arrow with a, with a triangle over it, that triangle is a special triangle. That triangle is known as delta. That means heat was added to the reaction. Right? So writing equations. There are several parts to writing an equation. But the first thing we need to do is we need to identify all substances involved. Okay? And then we use symbols to show the following things. How many? We use the coefficient. Coefficient, just like in math, is the number up front. Okay? We also use symbols to show what we're talking about. And that's the chemical symbols we get off of the periodic table or the chemical formula. Okay, We get these from the periodic table or we can get them from our polyatomic ion list. And in what state is our last question? Are they gases? Are they liquids? Are they solids? Or are they aqueous? Remember, there are diatomic elements. Hydrogen is a diatomic element. Nitrogen, oxygen. Remember, diatomic elements cannot be by themselves. They must be paired up with either each other or something else. All right? The diatomic elements start at number 7, atomic number 7 on the periodic table. 
They make a seven all the way down to iodine. And don't forget about hydrogen. There are seven of them total. All right, so writing equations. Let's we're going to go from word form to the equation form, okay? Now remember, we have a few questions to ask ourselves. But when we first see an equation like this, we need to pull out the important information. All right? Aluminum is important. Copper 2 chloride is important. Copper is important and aqueous aluminum chloride is important, okay? That tells us what chemicals we're dealing with. All right, so remember we have a few questions we need to ask ourselves. How many of what and what state? All right, let's go through and read this. All right, we have two atoms of aluminum. Okay, so we have two. That's how many we have. Aluminum. And aluminum is metal. Do you think it's a solid, liquid, or gas? Well, more than likely, unless it's mercury and it's a metal, it's going to be a solid. Okay? The next thing we need to pull out is three units of aqueous copper 2 chloride. Well, we need to write a formula for copper 2 chloride. You'll remember that from Chapter 7. Okay? So it's going to be CuCl2. Now, what state is it in? Well, in the problem, it tells us it's aqueous. How do we denote aqueous? With a little aq. Okay? Now, it says right here that we need to produce. What does to produce mean? Well, that means to put an arrow. We're going to produce three. That's how many of the next thing. We're going to produce three atoms of copper. Okay, what's the, what's the symbol for copper? CEU, of course. All right. Copper is a metal. What state is it in? More than likely, it's a metal. So it's a solid. Um, and we know means plus. Okay, and two, two units of aqueous aluminum chloride. Well, we need to write a formula for aluminum chloride. We remember that from Chapter 7. ALCL3. And it tells us that it's aqueous, so we put an AQ afterwards. So essentially, we're taking... What's up here in words, asking ourselves these three questions, and then making it into this equation? Someone in an earlier class or in one of my classes asks, are the states of matter important? Absolutely. Okay. Describing equations, just a real quick um, overview. You've probably seen me use some of this terminology. Okay. Describing coefficients. There are really three ways we describe coefficients. We refer to an individual atom as an atom. Okay, That's if something is just by itself. Just by itself. For example, aluminum in the last example on the reactants and copper on the right, or in the products, that was an atom. A covalent substance we refer to as a molecule. Well, what's a covalent substance? A covalent substance shares electrons. Well, what shares electrons? Two nonmetals. Well, where are the nonmetals found? They're found on the right upper side of the periodic table. Upper right side of the periodic table. Okay? And an ionic substance we refer to as a unit. So let's look at these three examples. Remember, an ionic substance contains a metal or a polyatomic ion. Alright, let's look at these three examples. The first one is 3CO2. Well, Carbon and oxygen are both nonmetals, so that means they have covalent bonds, which means that it is a molecule. So we have three molecules of carbon dioxide. Okay. The second example, we just have magnesium by itself. So we say we have two atoms of magnesium. And the third example is MgO. Well, magnesium is a metal and it's paired with something else, so that means it's ionic. It is an ionic substance, so we refer to that as units. We have four units of magnesium oxide. All right, that's just an overview of how to write an equation. If you have any questions, let me know.